So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jussi Mäkelä. I'm the junior researcher in this project. I'm the project group. And, um, and I'm going to tell you something about uh, what I've learned about Josef Beuys. And uh, I think his art was basically just, uh, he was trying to heal the world. Nothing more, nothing less. But um, I'll be reading from the paper to keep it somewhere around 20 minutes. So, sorry for that. If you cut yourself, don't bandage your finger, bandage in a knife, is the title of an artwork by a German sculptor, Josef Beuys. And it is a mundane kitchen knife, uh, 18 centimeters in its total length, the wooden handle being half of that. And the tip of the bla blade is bandaged with about two inches of adhesive plaster. There is a small brown stain in the plaster that looks like and probably is dried blood. According to Victoria Walters, the knife hints for a quasi-homeopathic healing practice that operates within Boyce's work uh, by triggering a small degree of pain that stimulates the patient's system to heal itself. In addition, it can be argued that Boyce wanted us to pay attention also to the healing of the cause instead of just taking care of the symptoms. This can be seen as another way of calling for the cultural ecological analysis that is an essential strand in eco-justice education. Boyce's eventual aim was to heal the world, and in that context, it can be argued that the individual human being is the knife, and the trans that the transformative healing process needs to happen within people's inner world in order to stop us cutting more wounds into the more than human world and our human communities as they are embedded in that world. Since his early childhood, Boyce had a keen interest in nature and natural sciences, but he gradually became disappointed in the positivist explanations of the world they offered. After barely surviving the Second World War, Boyce decided to turn toward art, as he saw it necessary to reconstruct the whole problem of life. Throughout his whole artistic career, Boyce concentrated on developing a new kind of understanding of art that would lead to a social organism as a work of art. Above all, Beuys was a German thinker and artist for whom it was very natural to use dialectics as an artistic method of inquiry. Walters asserts that unlike Hegel for whom dialectics was a route to pure reason, Beuys was seeking to bring about the creative shaping of all thought, all forming, whereby the human being comes to shape new forms in response to the world. Walters calls this an affirming dialectics that might be regarded as reconciliation in the sense of process whereby practice and theory are reconciled as forms of material shaping and humans are reconciled to their freedom of and power as creative beings in connection with the world, both as individuals and collectives. In this light, Boyce's sculptural theory demonstrates a method of constantly struggling to maintain a balance balance between two opposing poles, the pole of chaotic state and the pole of ordered state. These poles are to be understood as absolutes or extremes, so when thinking of the chaotic state, we should see it in its totality as an idea of chaos. For example, will in its chaotic state means pure will without a direction, a selfless volition that is for boys the origin of energy for all creativity. Maybe we can see it in cosmic terms as the moment before the universe was born. Everything is there, but incomprehensible for us. In correspondence, when we think of the pole of ordered state, we should see it as something that has become a total abstraction, a rigid crystalline form, a thought without a thinker, a pure idea with no connection to life. There are three elements in Boyce's theory of sculpture, the opposing poles and between them the moving human being who seeks balance. While studying the theory, we have to make a couple of notions to avoid falling into anthropocentric assumptions. First, chaos should not be understood as suggesting that there is no order without a human balancer. Chaos is undetermined maybe only for us humans, who crave order in a world that is ultimately too complex for us to fully comprehend. Another consideration is that the theory is mainly about being a human being, 
It is mainly focused on our actions and how they relate to social constructions. By that I mean that basically the theory seems to fit better into describing our ways of structuring the social or societal circumstances to build a social organism as a work of art. The suitability to assess our relationships to the world as a whole is maybe more questionable but possible after redefining the role of the balance-seeking human being. Obviously, the natural world does not need a human being as a bringer of balance or as a reconciler. In the context of nature, the more than human world, which also includes human beings, we have to look at the role of the reconciler differently. It is not about bringing the balance, but trying not to harm the balance, something that we have not succeeded to do very well. On the contrary, as a part of nature, the humans in industrial and capitalist contexts have done everything except brought about balance. The current state of the world is a result of not trying to find or maintain a balance. For boys, the sculptural principle that he formed into his theory of sculpture is present in all human activity, so also in thinking and speaking. My objects are to be seen as stimulants for the transformation of the idea of sculpture or of art in general. They should provoke thoughts about what sculpture can be and how the concept of sculpting can be extended to the invisible materials used by everyone. Thinking forms, how we mold our thoughts, or spoken forms, how we shape our thoughts into words, or social sculpture, how we mold and shape the world in which we live. Sculpture as an evolutionary process, everyone an artist. It can be argued that the infamous slogan, every human being is an artist, is a logical conclusion from Boyce's theory of sculpture and his idea of social sculpture. As he confessed to Willoughby Sharp in 1969, objects were not as important for him as thinking that precedes the forming of a physical material. For me, the formation of the thought is already sculpture. My own background is not as strongly in art as it is in education. I, it was during the teacher studies when I first came across with Boyce's slogan, everyone is an artist, and since then I have been drawn to the idea, contemplating the core meaning of it. That is also one reason why I directed myself toward artistry, not to be a professional artist, but to understand what it means to be an artist. So when Boyce defines the quality of being an artist as the ability to think, to feel, to suffer, and to will something, I very much agree. Thus, expressed in my own words, I would say that artistry is above all a decision. Being an artist is possible for everyone because it is a question of letting it happen. Looking at my own processes of making art, it is many times questionable to call it making art. Oftentimes it feels more like the art is happening through me, which is actually pretty much connected to the original meaning of the word inspired. Originally, to inspire meant that a divine or supernatural being imparts a truth or idea to someone. While not trying to suggest that art is a divine or supernatural being, I still claim that it is not something that I just create out of nowhere or from myself. It is exactly the being in the creative balance that induces this flow that in a way makes me and moves through me as it enters the world. The process starts often with a title and a feeling about the right material, so the final piece is undoubtedly what Almer calls a word thing. The artwork consists of its title, the material substances it has, and its form. The title and materials are linguistic elements that make present the conscious and pre-conscious registers together with the form of the artwork. Consequently, forming a conception of the artwork is the happening of art in the understanding of the viewer, where the same elements, words, material substance and form appear. So the happening of art takes place in the processes of both making and experiencing art. Brent Dean Robbins argues that Goethe's way of science is a form of cultural therapeutics, the aim of which is to own up to our obligations to that which is unconscious yet continues to claim us in our technological world. It is a matter of making explicit those responses to the world that are covered over or concealed by layers of culture, but which nevertheless continue to call us and which remain accessible only through careful, critically engaged description of phenomena. 
the process of owning up to our obligations is one that can be a healing process, the process of coming home to ourselves. Hence, it is therapeutic. This connects to what Wendor Berry, Berry calls a ritual of healing, that perceiving and accurately understanding our proper place in creation is curative for us, because it can make, make us whole. Thus, Goethean science is potentially curative because, as Robin asserts, it may restore to health and wholeness those who practice it. According to Goethe, science should be transformative for the scientist. The human being knows himself only in so far as he knows the world. He perceives the world only in himself and himself only in the world. Every new object, clearly seen, opens up a new organ of perception in us. Drawing all this together, it can be argued that there are hidden layers of reality that we may perceive through dwelling in relation with other phenomena, which will eventually cause a transformation in us. Whereas Robbins argues that studying nature is transformative for the scientist, we might supplement that the happening of art may be transformative for the artist, keeping in mind that everyone is an artist. In both cases, it is a matter of invisible forms or spiritual forces revealing themselves to us in contemplative being present. This, in turn, may help us to understand our proper place, which can be seen as the point where ethics originates. We become whole through an inner transformation that is generated by accurately perceiving or working to perceive the whole world, where we have our proper place. And the more we become whole, the better we understand how we are interrelated with everything surrounding us, and the more we feel compelled to ethics. That is, such a recognition of interdependent relationality pushes us toward considering with others how we should live together to promote ecological, social, and personal well-being. In the installation Growing Lesser, I conjoined the ancient scientific knowledge and the Fibonacci sequence uh, in the spiral form, and the prolonged studying of nature that is present in the seemingly chaotic forms of sticks and branches. As a result, both the form and the material express essentially the same thing, the mystery and order of the world. The Fibonacci sequence is all around the universe, and its consistency, without exception, is just incomprehensible. On the other hand, the formation of branches is not only mysterious, but it also results in fascinating shapes. Through a careful, prolonged study, the diversity of the forms in the branches starts to reveal patterns that connect particular characteristics to particular tree species. However, the fundamental mystery of the forming processes remains still a subject of awe. But awe is as elementary to admiring as a delusion of superior knowledge is to submission. That is why the title refers to us facing the incomprehensible, visible and invisible realms. The title plays an important role, so also this artwork can be defined as a word thing, trying to communicate on both conscious and pre-conscious levels. The mysteries of more than human world are present in the form and substance. The title is calling for realizing our place within the world we live. It is an outcry, outcry for humility that breeds a quest for a balance or a will to gain systemic wisdom. Unless we humble ourselves and abandon the delusions of mastering the world, we will bring the world as we know it into its premature destruction. Reflecting Bateson, we might assert that the tendency of favoring fast and effective solutions to oversimplified causalities, instead of looking for the patterns that connect and cybernetic, cybernetic solutions to complex relations that the problems have with various phenomena, is a symptom of not recognizing anything but a rationalized positivistic world. It is the result of a technological calculative mindset, which is, which is exactly what Boyce wanted us to recuperate from through becoming artists. The healing of the world has to start from the healing of our broken and violent understanding of the world. We must, we must bandage the knife. Boyce explained in Documenta 6 the origin of the creative balance between will and thought in his theory of sculpture. Selfless volition, which can be discovered in pure thought as pure will, is the foundation of the freedom to act. But if in this freedom there are no longer necessities and constraints, what compels me to act at all? The love that comes from my connectedness with the world. In this space between volition and thought, the heart acts, and the love that comes from such connectedness is the only motive. Evidently, 
Boyce was convinced that recognizing the connectedness with the world would generate love to guide all our activities. It can be argued that his total body of work is but an effort to make people recognize such connectedness. As he stated already in 1969, to be a teacher is my greatest work of art. The rest is the waste product, a demonstration. If you want to explain yourself, you must present something tangible. According to a legend Boyce kept telling, during the Second World War he was seriously wounded and buried in the snow in 1943 in Crimea, and the Tatars found him and wrapped him in fat and felt to keep him warm and to help him restore his body heat. This wartime experience aided him a couple of decades later to develop a unique set of sculptural materials that bear spiritual values that connected to the idea of healing the wounds. By using these materials, Boyce aimed to stimulate people's inner world to help them overcome the wound of all of us and recognize the aspects of reality that are often suppressed beneath the surface of material wealth and success. In both fat and felt, their structure that is at the same time disordered and uniform can be seen also as a vehicle for the pole of chaos in Boyce's theory of sculpture, which meant for Boyce that they are essentially therapeutic. Chaos can have a healing character, coupled with the idea of open movement which channels the warmth of, warmth of chaotic energy into order or form. In the core of Boyce's theory is the flux of energy. The chaotic substance of fat is equal to the energy it contains, the pure undirected energy that corresponds to the pure will as a spiritual force. So, for boys, chaos is not something negative, but all the life potential there is. That is why the aspect of chaos is an important substance of fat, and why it is therapeutic in, its, in his theory. Furthermore, Stepping out of the delimited rational mindset that is typical for a Westerner, we should understand that what we see as chaos might not, by, might not be as chaotic as we think. We regard it, uh, it as chaos because we are unable to grasp it, uh, get a grasp of its complexity. Drawing from Gregory Bates and Wendell Berry, it needs to be argued that we are always doomed to suffer from a lack of systemic wisdom as we are a part of that system and not above or outside of it. It is eternally impossible for us to thoroughly understand the world we live in. The therapeutic aspect of this lies in the understanding and acceptance of it. So, we might think that the chaotic substance of fat is reminding us of our lack of ultimate systemic wisdom and in a way guiding us to struggle for a deeper understanding, thus calling us to heal ourselves to be more whole, which in turn would lead us to affection towards and healing of the world. The therapeutic aspect of fat lies in its call to us toward reconciliation, not of something outside of us, but the reconciliation of ourselves and our lives within the world. That is coming home to ourselves or accurately understanding our proper place in creation. Through the familiarity of its substance, fat calls us to imagine our place in the world, for, as Berry suggests, Imagination thrives on contact, on tangible connection, continuing that for humans to have a responsible relationship to the world, they must imagine their places in it. By imagination we recognize the sympathy, we recognize with sympathy the fellow members, human and non-human, with whom we share our place. So instead of mistakenly uh, considering chaos as a threat, something to be defeated or controlled, we might conclude that chaos itself is not threatening to us, but rather to our misunderstanding of the world as something to be controlled through our rationality. Finally, this is why boys regarded materials with a chaotic substance suitable for communi communicating in a way that would help us to overcome the wound of all of us. He developed his language of healing to help us recognize and treat our wound, our illusionary, illusionary illusionary hyper-disconnectedness with the world. Or as I suggest in New Paradigm, we, knew, we do not need as much racial up intelligence as we need warm-hearted understanding. This might be the way to understand all other living things, not as resources, but as companions. We do not have to live as if we are alone. Thanks.